Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to From Data to Changing America. I'm your host, Anthony Moreno. Today we discuss health care, an issue that impacts us all. In New Mexico, a grassroots coalition is working to establish the New Mexico Health Security Plan. It's a plan they say can shift private insurance into a supplementary role. The group says this proposed health care plan can automatically cover most New Mexicans. Here to share more on this campaign and plan is Dr. Mary Feldblum, Executive Director of the Health Security for New Mexicans campaign. Dr. Feldblum, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to begin if you could share with us a little bit about the campaign and your organization. It's a pleasure to be here, Anthony. Thank you for this interview, because I think it's important that your, your viewers really understand what we're trying to do. We are probably the largest coalition in the history of our state. 170 organizations support this plan. And it's uh, um, a very diverse uh, or coalition. In addition, 37 cities and counties have passed resolutions over the years in support of this plan. And that includes, it's been bipartisan, it includes Santa Fe, which you would expect, and it includes um, Roswell, which we endorsed it several years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, there's been a number of communities that we know that uh, have endorsed this plan. Uh, the plan that you're working on is legislation. It's the New Mexico Health Security Act. I'd like to hear from you a little bit about this act and why you think it's, it's needed. Well, first of all, I think that COVID, the tragedy of COVID-19 has really exposed a lot of flaws in our healthcare system. People who had insurance through their employers may have lost that completely. And in addition, um, there, we're finding that the number of uninsured is increasing. In, in the last, last year, it was estimated to be 187,000 New Mexicans, and it's grown 14% to 214,000 already, and that's probably an undercount. So we, we've got a problem of health insecurity, really, where you can't count on health insurance. With this, if there's a downturn in the economy, it's your employer's choice whether to offer it, and then many people simply can't afford it, and many small employers can't afford it. And this is despite um, the heroic efforts of the Affordable Care Act, which has definitely reduced the rate of uninsured in New Mexico from uh, 22% and last year it was 10%. Now it's gone up for sure. So the health security plan then would uh, allow us to set up our own health plan in New Mexico. And we have a state with a small population, 2 million people, to have what's called a multi-payer uh, system where you have not only different insurance companies, but different insurance companies offer different policies, different co-pays, different deductibles. This has is an expense in and of itself to administer all those plans through the insurance industry, but it's also an expense to our hospitals, our clinics, and our doctor's offices who are, have to, to go th way through and, and hire staff at, for that could go to health services and not to health administration. Yeah. The United States pays the highest rate of administration in uh, costs in the world. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because obviously there's so much that goes into administration of healthcare plans. Um, obviously, just healthcare in general is a confusing topic for a lot of people. And every year when people are trying to figure out what plan they're going to choose, there's a lot to understand. And when you talk about administrative cost, I'd like to hear how you think this plan could help lower administrative costs and streamline that that um, administrative uh, cost uh, function. Well, it's interesting. The recent fiscal analysis that was performed by KNG um, discussed the administrative overhead costs, and when you think about it, it's billing 
um, to insurance companies. Uh, all the work that goes in in terms of claims processing. And that is an enormous uh, piece of the problem. The Health Security Act um, is hoping to achieve a 5% administrative overhead for the plan itself. And in addition, as KNG points out, there are administrative savings for hospitals and clinics and for doctor's offices because they don't have to deal with all that complexity. And then they can hire extra nurses, extra staff, and actually maybe even spend more time with their patients than they do with the computer. Now you're talking about the nearly $400,000 fiscal analysis that KNG uh, Health Consulting out of Maryland uh, took a look at uh, the different scenarios of this proposed plan. There was, I believe, four scenarios, is that correct? Yes, they had to do four scenarios because uh, they were asked to assume that the plan would begin in 2024 because it's gonna take time to work out the details. And there are a lot of unknowns, as we all know. And so uh, economists love to do what ifs. So they were asked to come up with four different approaches, uh, different assumptions to deal with the cost and the revenue side of the health security plan. Now, one of these scenarios, uh, we should mention that this was the Legislative Finance Committee that uh, took a look at this and um, this analysis with, with KNG Health Consulting uh, to figure out if this plan was uh, fiscally uh, possible here in New Mexico. Now, it was reported earlier uh, this year that one plan would cost the state $5.8 billion over the next five years. Now, you penned an op-ed recently that said that this scenario was the one that most news outlets focused on, but weren't considering the possible changes down the road when savings could be possibly uh, obtained. Obviously, starting something this big is going to cost a lot of money. And that's really what a lot of people are concerned about, though, is how much this plan is going to cost. So can you kind of share with us exactly how this plan is going to be feasible fiscally? Well, I think uh, people confuse the cost and the revenue side. So the first thing to do is to figure out what would this plan cost? It is assumed to have automatic coverage for most New Mexicans. KNG did not assume Medicare recipients in their cost analysis. And they came up with four scenarios, and I think for cost. And what they say in their, in their final report, their uh, preliminary report had a lot of uh, problems with it, and they had to correct them. But in their final report, they point out that the savings with health security compare, compared to what we're spending on healthcare, excluding Medicare, and is the savings would be between 1.6 billion and 2.6 billion dollars within five years, and that's an enormous amount of savings. So that's that's uh, and and um, I figured out the rate of increase within this time if you compare the rate of increase of the health security plan to the rate of increase um, in costs over the four year period with that current system, again, excluding Medicare. Um, the current system is 16% and the, um, the four scenarios range from 11% to 7% increase. That's dramatic. And then comes the revenue side and that's of course what with, with, with the five billion you were talking about is a shortfall. In other words, you figure out a cost and then what, how much public dollars can you assume to cover that cost like Medicaid? And what are the premiums and employer contributions to cover that cost? And uh, so you have to make some assumptions there. And um, that they uh, pointed out that um, one scenario over four years would create a shortfall of five point uh, nine five point billion dollars. But what they didn't tell you, and I and I presented um, to a legislative committee recently, and KNG was there, and I heard uh, Lane Koenig say we should have done that. You have to look at it. Start off with year twenty twenty four, and you're you're going to have your highest shortfall there because you're starting a new program, 
and then it goes down each year. And so what's fascinating is to look at the different scenarios and that one scenario, which was the 5.9 billion or whatever it was shortfall, um, actually goes down enormously over those four years. And then there's the uh, there's another scenario, the scenario four, that actually creates a surplus. So that's where the what ifs are. You know, you what are your assumptions when you create? You know, how how much money are you assuming the premiums would be the the the, the uh, employer contributions? We have to figure out, they would have to figure out what federal dollars can be assumed. And there are a lot of unknowns. And so, but what they did was essentially all their scenarios show one, that the shortfall is reduced. And in one case, there's a surplus. And I think that's that shows that it's in fact, um, even given their assumptions, economically viable. And it confirms what two other studies demonstrated in New Mexico, that um, if you, do an old fashioned health risk pool um, and you're not concerned about pre existing conditions and you've got economies of scale with the numbers and you're reducing administrative costs and the complexity of the system, then you're going to, the state will save enormous amount of money. And, it's, and by the state, I mean this not only the state of New Mexico, but state government. Um, and they point out the savings if Medicaid is put into this program if the health insurance exchanges. I mean, there's an enormous amount of savings here. Well, it's going to cost the public some money to get this up and running if it is approved in the state legislators. So let's talk about that. How much do you think it's going to cost for the state to be able to implement a program like this? Well, you, ha you the, the state doesn't appropriate for three years. The estimate is about three years to do the details of this. So we're really talking about this upcoming session in 2021. And then the fiscal budget begins, you know, July 1st, as you well know, um, 2021 and would end in uh, 20, June 30th, 2022. And so this, this um, it would, it, the bill would entail setting up a team of experts, commissioners who represent the geographic areas of the state so it's not an albuquerque santa fe dominated commission mm -hmm. and they 10 of them would represent consumer with expertise in healthcare and business interests and health facility and provider interests and they would be responsible for this so it's going to take some time to set it up there's a nominating committee so they're not just appointed by the governor through an old boy network or old girl network it's in fact um going to be a very careful process of selecting uh, people who would sit. And then once they are um, appointed, then the question becomes um, what, when, how fast can they be appointed and what in the time that's uh, left, maybe seven or eight months, what would they accomplish in that year? Uh, what staff would they need? Can there be staff, because we're in a budget crisis, staff used from the state, the insurance commissioner, from the attorney general, you know, from the legislative council, the, the Department of Health, Department of Human Services, there's staff that could actually help this commission with, and what's exciting about it is this plan is structured like a cooperative. Yeah. So it's our plan, anything they decide, because all of us know we have no say really with our insurance company that sends us our premiums going up. And um, in this case, we're going to have a say, and doctors are going to have a say, and hospitals are going to have a say in how this plan is structured. It's a really wonderful opportunity for the state of New Mexico to develop something that is smothered in green and red chili, that it's yeah. ours. It's well, it, it sounds it sounds amazing. I mean, it's it sounds every when we talk about healthcare and the opportunity to cover most New Mexicans, obviously that's going to get people's attention. But going back to the cost, how much? Looking at the dollars, you mentioned that uh, some positions that need to be filled, and the but and and the the staff that's going to be needed to put this into place. But what what dollar amount are we looking at to get this thing up and running? Because we are in a challenging time right now with the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact it's had on our economy. So are lawmakers even going to look at this in the legislative session and consider it because it's going to cost a, a, a good amount of money to get this thing implemented? Tell me how much it's going to cost to start well, it up. Um, okay, the uh, Senator Ortiz Pino is looking at that very carefully. 
And he's thinking um, something like uh, $500,000. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, 500, yeah. Are, are you, uh, you're saying it's going to cost $500,000 to begin this process. Is that annually? Is that initially? Annually, yeah, I mean, tell me what. That would be initially. And, um, and then it would have to be re reconsidered the following session. And we don't know what the budget will look like then. There are two ways to fund this. One is Senator Ortiz Pino thinks that the amount of money needed to do this initial first year for a few months startup is would using staff from uh, various agencies would not be very much in a in billions of dollar budget. Um, then, uh, but there is another way of doing this, and that is through a loan. Um, and during the special session. It was SB3, which set up a loan to small businesses who were in trouble uh, because of the pandemic. And that loan came from the severance tax fund and will be paid back. And so that is another option that can be looked at. So it's not a general fund appropriation. So those are two ideas that I think are being um, uh, looked at carefully. And I know that the bill drafter for Senator Ortiz Pino is looking very carefully at what what resources are in it already there that wouldn't cost money and what in fact would cost money and how much are we talking about? So I wish I could give you a, a hardcore figure, but it's in the process of discussion. And part of it is figuring out what are the tasks this commission has to do and how often they would meet, you know, because that would cost money. So all this kind of uh, detail has to be carefully worked out. But the first year, shouldn't cost very much. And the legislature would have constant reports. And at any point, the legislature could say, no, this isn't working. Or it could say, mm, we have to fix this. You know, they, they'll have a say in terms of what we think is a very important process for developing this homegrown plan. Um, but I, you know, I can't give you, you know, I wish I could give you the hardcore figures, but I know Senator Ortiz Pino doesn't think it would be very much. Well, our audience is certainly familiar with, uh, you know, how New Mexico government works, especially when it comes to the committee uh, hearings and how uh, legislation may change there. I, if you could share with us, what's the difference between this proposal and universal health coverage that we're familiar with that some countries some developed countries have many actually and mm -hmm. um and some proposals that have been uh, floated at the national level uh, with our national representatives federal re representatives so what's the difference between this plan and that well i think um having looked at various european countries they all do it differently and uh, men, and of course, so many of them started their programs after World War II. So they, it was an advantage in starting from scratch in some ways because everything was destroyed, um, like in England. And um, here in the United States, we have a different challenge because over the years, we've developed programs like Medicare and Medicaid. There's veterans health care. There's Indian health. It's a very complicated system. So from a state perspective, which is different from Medicare for all, right? From a state perspective, you have to respect those existing laws and protect those people with those benefits. And, and then you have to um, figure out how can you design something that would automatically cover so people don't have to shop around and they'd have good comprehensive coverage and freedom of choice of doctor and hospital, including across state line, which is important in Las Cruces. And um, so, so over the years, that's what we've been looking at. Medicare for all has a, that's national. And you can decide that you want to abolish certain laws. You can, you know, automatically include Medicaid. You don't have to deal with a waiver system anymore. You, there's a if Congress decides this, um, they have a great deal more flexibility than a state would have. So they, that's a big challenge. There's a there are two Medicare for all bills. Uh, one is the Sanders bill, and the other one is the Jayapal bill in the House, and they have differences to them too. And um, we think that in New Mexico that we're better off dealing with our own homegrown solutions and getting waivers if we need to. What's fascinating, and a lot of people don't realize this, is the Affordable Care Act 
has a waiver for state innovation provision, assuming the Affordable Care Act isn't thrown out by the Supreme Court. And, uh, and that allows states to do something the way we want to do and still get all those federal dollars as long as Congress allows for that. And uh, so that is uh, very exciting. And we in New Mexico were key to putting in that provision because Senator Bigaman realized that the exchange, the health insurance exchange may not be a solution. It was in Massachusetts, but it may not be a solution for New Mexico. And it hasn't grown enormously. I mean, it's really uh, has, I think maybe barely 50,000 people have um, purchased through that. Medicaid has been much more important and Medicaid expansion. Uh, for our state, we have a low-income state. Yeah, and we've seen we've seen uh, how that expansion has impacted uh, many in our state and states that haven't approved that expansion and what's happened there. I want to talk with you about an issue when we talk about programs like this or um, Medicaid for all, Medicare for all, and uh, universal health coverage. Many folks who have good insurance, what they feel is good good insurance are concerned about losing that coverage and walking away from that coverage. What do you have to say for folks who, are, who have those concerns when these proposals come up? Well, I think that the COVID-19 virus has been a, a cold water in our face. Um, you think you have health care and you may not. All of a sudden, uh, you're, you, you work for an employer and the employer says, I'm sorry, I can't do it anymore or I can't hire you anymore. I mean, health care in the United States um, has been dependent on employment primarily. And it's uh, in the 60s and mid 60s when President Johnson pushed through Medicare and then Medicaid, I mean, we got an additional uh, coverage for people because the private insurance system and employer based system didn't work for all people and so you're it, you're you don't have health security now and i think studies are indicating and i'm hearing and i know the teachers premiums are going up state employees premiums are going up it's not just the premiums it's your out-of-pocket costs it's the deductibles it's the co-pays it's the surprise bills that people get when they have insurance like in carlsbad and then they get sued by the hospital because they can't pay those bills, those inflated bills. And so that the system is not only costly with all the administrative costs I talked about, it, it is insecure. And I think that's what COVID-19 has educated a lot of people and why our, our coalition is growing. And so the idea is less, why don't we set up our own health plan? You can buy extra, an employer can buy extra. The services offered can be no less than what the state employees have, which is really a great package of mental health, behavioral health um, and it also includes acupuncture chiropractic treatments it's an excellent package i've i've showed it to various companies who think they have great packages and they're surprised and um so that is great services and then what's really important is to be able to have freedom of choice of doctor and hospital the system today not only the networks decreasing but people are finding that their their doctor that they loved all of a sudden leaves. Yeah. It's no longer you know in the network, and then they have to find another one. And we're also finding that in New Mexico we have a problem of scarcity of physicians. We have I think 30 out of our 33 counties are medically uninsured, uninsured. and we have a growing number of doctors and and the nurses association and the pharmacists, the independent pharmacy pharmacists love this plan um, because they see it as simplifying their lives. A doctor, there is a Mayo Clinic study, uh, several of them in fact, that, that, and I don't know about New Mexico, um, but it's a national study and it says that physicians spend three times more on the computer than they do looking at their patients. Yeah. And it's an extraordinary complicated system. So when talking to physicians, and we're gonna have actually another workshop with a whole bunch of physicians on Saturday, yeah. is imagine being able to design a system of accountability, it has to be accountable, um, but that's simplified. And that actually provides the, the information that a system would need to know to assure um, you know, accurate payments, no fraud, but also quality of care, the outcomes. 
are we getting a healthier population? I find it fascinating that KNG, which was no sympathizer to this uh, approach, talks about um, at the end of their report, the health benefits to this plan um, over 10 years, you know, having a healthier population. I mean, to me, that's well worth the state investing in. Um, the other thing that they, by the way, they left out and um, is that auto insurance and workers' compensation insurance premiums are reduced under this plan. Okay, so let's, that, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we just have a minute left, but I wanna ask you about drug prices and how you think this plan can impact that. Absolutely, and we, the Pharmacists Association, in fact, helped develop the language in the bill. Uh, and imagine doing bulk purchasing of drugs. And I was concerned it's 1.678 million people enough to have cloud. <laughs> and I was assured, yes, and there are networks around the country that this plan could join. And I think what's interesting, and in your area, Senator Jeff Steinborn introduced a bill that was passed that set up a pharmaceutical uh, purchasing council. And the idea was to have the state agencies purchase together. Um, and the, the fiscal analysis said that millions of dollars would be saved. Now, and Senator Steinborn wants to see this develop into something for the entire state, so, which is wonderful because that sets the stage for health security, which requires not only pharmaceutical drug pricing, bulk purchasing, but other medical equipment and supplies like wheelchairs, yeah. oxygen tanks, I mean, which um, are just overpriced. Okay, Dr. Mary Feldblum, I want to thank you so much for joining us. You, she is director, executive director of the Health Security for New Mexicans campaign. Uh, you could find out more information at their website. Thank you so much for joining us for the program. Thank you, and I'm willing to come back anytime. <laughs> We want to thank you for joining us on Fronteras to Changing America. I'm Anthony Morneau. We'll see you next time.